To get to this new tool, it's provided by Kantar Media through the SRDS uh, portal. If you're a San Diego State University student, notice you have to be logged in. Either you have to be at San Diego State University or you can be uh, logged in by proxy through your library login. You'll see here there's a bunch of different feed tools. Most of them are locked, not actually provided uh, by, to San Diego State University. But the tool that we're going to be looking at today is the Nielsen Segmentation and Market Solutions tool available here. So let's open this up and take a look at what we can do with it. So the first thing that you're going to see once you log into the system is a report dashboard here. Eventually, as you generate your own reports tailored in a way that you find useful, you'll be able to favorite them and save them for later use. And today we're not going to go through every single type of report. In particular, we're not going to focus on any of these pop facts types of reports. These are very useful reports, but they tend to be sort of a default auto-generated uh, variety. So I'll leave it to you to explore those and see if they're useful for your purposes. Instead, what I'd like to look at is a couple of the more advanced tools and we'll walk through some of the more advanced functionality and how to interpret the various metrics that come out of these reports. So the report that we're going to run now here is down available in the segmentation report. We're going to run something called a market potential report. So what this report is going to make us able to do is we're going to select a couple of key variables. And again, we'll continue with our theme related to beer consumption. And it's a market potential report because it'll give us a sense of how different geographic markets compare with respect to these particular variables. Okay, it can take a moment for the dashboard to load. Sometimes you have to be patient when using this particular system. I'm going to give my report a name. I'll call it Beer Preference. And respect the report output type. For now, we'll call it an interactive report. I'd like to show you some of the uh, dashboard solutions, and eventually we'll export some of those results directly to Excel later. We're going to be using the Nielsen Prism system. Okay, and we can actually grab some of the data that we looked, went to look for here. So I'm going to go to uh, syndicated data sources, Nielsen Consumer Profiles, and again, I don't have all of these different data sets and every variable is in there memorized. It's something you have to explore and look for. You know, time there's actually a search tool here to help you. But in this particular case, I usually know there's an alcohol section. So alcohol yep, comes from the Nielsen Scarborough system. And looking across the various selections, we have options of detecting particular brands that they've drank in the past 30 days. I'm going to grab here domestic light beer drank most often is Bud Light. So let's select their light beer of choice is Bud Light. Let's see, for domestic regular beer drink most often, they include a craft beer option here, Sam Adams. I'll grab those. I could continue to grab a few more. We're allowed to grab them to up to additional 158. That'd be a little much. And then for an analysis area, select California. And then there's an important option here that says, do you want to calculate the index to the analysis coverage area? If we keep it at no, Later, we're going to be seeing a metric called the index value. The default index value of 100 will be normed to the entire United States adult population. But in our particular case here, we're only interested in looking within California. So we're making the choice that we want an index value of 100 not to represent the typical US adult, but we want an index value of 100 to represent the typical California adult. And then we can run this report and it'll take a moment. Okay, and after a moment, our report ran. First, we'll see that, yep, we in fact did get the results just for the state of California. And we'll see that across the columns here, we have two major headers. The domestic light beer drink most often is Bud Light. So that represents the first one, two, three, four, five, six columns. These are different statistics reported with respect to that variable. And again, we have those same uh, six categories of statistics, but now they're reported for domestic light beer drink most often is Sam Adams. Now, when I look at this report, I realized I didn't have my settings the way I really wanted them. What I wanted was I wanted to analyze only within California. However, I did want to break out into different geographic areas within California. Particularly, I wanted to separate by DMA, that is designated market area. These are marketer created geographic boundaries. Uh, they have a long and lengthy history of why they are a given shape, but they originate back in the days of broad, when broadcast media predominated. Luckily, we can change this really easy. I can just go to Options. I can go back to Prompt Selections. And this will just take me right back to where I was when I first generated the report. So now I can tweak my settings here. And what I realized I did wrong 
as it said, select the level of detail for your report. Well, I actually want components of my report. So I want to study only California, but I want those components of California. And now I have to select the geographic level of those components. And I can look at the state, which would just give me California again, or I can actually go into the DMA level, Nielsen Designated Market Area. Okay, now we can see that our report has run correctly reporting all the different DMAs. We'll see, we can actually see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You notice by the 12 codes here, there are 12 different DMAs in the state of California. Those 12 rows represent the DMA level statistics. While for to make things a little easier for you, uh, Nielsen has attempted to show these colored rows here to report, uh, to categorize different DMAs by their market potential index level for the first variable, Bud Light. To be honest, because we're using multiple variables here, I think these, these particular uh, color-coded um, summary rows are actually very confusing and they're of not much use to us. So we're gonna look past them while we're looking at making sense of these results. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to slice and dice this data a little bit and walk you through how to interpret these different metrics that we see along the columns. To do this, I'm gonna click the filter display button which will allow me to, to choose to you which parts of this table I show you at one time. I'm not actually changing any of the results, I'm just gonna be showing and hiding different metrics here. So we see here for analysis areas, I'm holding the control key on my keyboard so I can do a multiple select while skipping over the market potential index summary areas. So hopefully by doing it this way, we should be able to see just the DMAs and the total which represent California itself. And I had to uh, hold control down again and click and unclick to get the total to show back up again. That sort of thing happens. Okay, so now our report's a little easier to see. Now we see just the DMAs, the total for all California along the bottom. Now let's take a look over here to measures. Let's see just the base count first. So the base count actually has nothing to do with the two alcohol variables. You'll notice here the numbers are exactly the same for each DMA, regardless of the Bud Light or it's the Sam Adams variable. The base count is simply the total number of adults estimated to be in that particular DMA. No surprise, the largest DMA just in terms of pure population is Los Angeles, followed by San Francisco DMA, then followed closely by Sacramento and the San Diego area. Now I'm going to add in by holding control and clicking on base percent comp. Let's take notice how the base percentages are, are still the exact same numbers regardless of the variables. So that should signal to you that these numbers have nothing to do with Bud Light or Sam Adams, but it has instead something to do with the entire DMA. And also notice that each one of them adds up to 100%. So all this is saying of, of all the people who live in California, 44.78% of them, I'm sorry, adults, uh, live in Los Angeles, California, whereas 4.61% of them live in the Fresno, Visalia, California DMA. So to calculate these percentages, you simply would take the base count number and divide it by that total. Now I'm gonna turn off base comp percent and bring in estimated users. Now estimated users does vary across these two different variables, Bud Light and Sam Adams. These estimated users are in fact the total number of adults estimated to meet this criteria of, of the variable that we search. So in the case of San Diego, California, the estimate is that 168,213 adults have indicated that Bud Light is the domestic light beer that they drink most often, whereas 59,264 U.S. adults are estimated to say that the domestic regular beer they drink most often is Samuel Adams. Now I'm going to add in one more metric, the percent comp. Percent comp is telling us of all the people who meet that criteria for a particular variable, what percent of them are found in that particular DMA. So 
For example, we know that in total in California, 1,841,369 individuals are estimated to believe that the domestic light beer they drink most often is Bud Light, and 817,913 of those individuals live in Los Angeles, California. If I pull up my calculator and I take 817,913 and divide it by that total, 1, 8, 4, 7, 3, 6, 9, I get a percentage of 44.27%, which we see precisely here. So we can say that of all the people who drink Bud Light most often in California, 44.27% of them are found in Los Angeles. All right, I'm going to turn off all of the metrics and introduce two final metrics here. Users per 100 households and the market potential index. Users per 100 households means precisely that. It's telling us that if you were to grab 100 random households in a particular DMA, how many of those households would we estimate to meet the variable criteria? So let's take a look at domestic regular beer, most often uh, drank as being Samuel Adams. And let's take a look at Bakersfield, California right here. We have a number of 3.82. This is saying if we went to Bakersfield, California and randomly selected 100 households, we'd expect 3.82 of those households to actually have, some, have the person in the household say that their most often drank direct domestic regular beer is Samuel Adams. The average in all of California per 100 households, so if we just grabbed a random 100 households across all of California, not worrying about which particular DMA it is in, we would estimate that number to be 4.65. So in other words, in Bakersfield, it is a little, it is a little less likely than the state level, state level average that we would find a household that says that they drink Samuel Adams most often. Another way to look at these users per 100 households numbers Another way it's commonly reported, in fact, by marketers is this market potential index, or sometimes just called the index value. A market potential index value of 100 is the base. You'll notice that both of these totals are based at 100 because we set the setting to make all of California our base when we were setting our selections earlier. Typically speaking, when you see an index value, the expectation is the US national average is the index value of 100, but we specifically said, no, just use California as the base. These market potential index values then indicate to you how likely a particular household is to meet that particular variable criteria um, based on the DMA that it's in. So let's take a look at the Bud Light area again. And we see here that uh, the Monterey Salinas, California DMA has a market potential index of 116. Another way to interpret this is that a household in Monterey Salinas, California is 16% more likely than a general California household to have someone who says their most frequently drank light beer is Bud Light. In other words, they are more likely than the California state average. And again, I told you this is just another way to interpret the user per 100 households. Notice how that's 16 here for Monterey, but then the state average is 13.9, so it's more likely just looking at the 100 households, but the index value tells us the same thing. If 100 is the base and this number is higher, it's more likely than the state average. On the other hand, in San Francisco, 92 is less than 100, so people are people in San Francisco are less likely to have, to have their domestic light beer most commonly drank being Bud Light. And precisely speaking, we would say that it, they are 8% less likely than the entire state of California. All these numbers can be interpreted this way. You may have noticed that a few of these over here on the far right side are colored red. These red numbers are trying to indicate to us that the sample that's underneath all of these estimates, in this particular case, be very suspicious about the reliability of these numbers. It doesn't mean the numbers are inherently wrong, it just means that the margin of error is likely much too wide for us to be willing to trust those values. Now that we've walked through how to interpret all of these different statistics, we can always export. Um, export. Now we can export these results to Excel. If you want to export them to an Excel format, you can only have table view selected. And here's our results that we've exported. I just want to show you really quick, I told you that users per 100 households and market potential index are essentially 
the same exact statistic, just a slightly different way of uh, presenting them. To illustrate that to you, I'm going to create a scatter plot of these two statistics for Bud Light. And what should become apparent when you look at this quick correlation is that these two variables are perfectly correlated with one another. But another way, one variable is in fact the other variable just expressed differently. Another thing we may want to explore visually now that we have this data in Excel is, you know, maybe it's true that if, if, a house, uh, if there's more households drinking Sam Adams, which is considered to be a slightly premium craft domestic beer, maybe there's fewer households that are drinking Bud Light as their light beer of choice. We can run a scatter plot on these two. And I'm going to be a little lazy here and not label it properly. You can right click this, add a trend line, and display our R squared. And our R squared is 0.02, even though it looks like there's a very, very, very modest uh, negative correlation here. And the amount of variance explained from one on the other is so little, we would not draw any real conclusions from this. So at least based on the data we're looking at here, there doesn't appear to be a correspondence between the number of households in a DMA expected to drink Samuel Adams and the number of households expected to drink Bud Light. Of course, we could do much more thorough analysis, but at least in terms of exploring the data right here, that's a, it's an intriguing result. The last report that I'm going to show you today is the segment distribution report. Now to understand the segment distribution report, we have to be familiar with the Nielsen PRISM system. Hopefully this is something you're already familiar with, but if not, I did a quick Google search and looked up Nielsen PRISM PDF. The Nielsen PRISM system is an effort to segment every household into slightly over 60 different potential lifestyle segments. In other words, you can think of this as a off-the-shelf market segmentation solution useful to a wide array of different marketers. The PRISM system comes in a couple different flavors. There's one that specializes in financial expenditures, one in uh, technology usage, there's a base model, but the PRISM Premier system seems to be the emergent uh, sort of default uh, tool, the one that you're probably going to be exposed to and see most commonly in industry. The, Premier, the PRISM Premier system segments households first into three broad categories. First, it categorizes households either they're in their young years, family life years, or mature years. It then segments each household by their affluence from low to high. Finally, it segments these markets into four different geographic quadrants, whether they live in urban, suburban, second city, or town and rural areas. These are actually all the same segments that you see in the above chart here. They're just sorted first by geography. So those three dimensions are what drive and then unique lifestyle or unique demographic traits create these specific sub-segments that we see here, like the young digerati, upward bound, the cosmopolitans, and so on. Nielsen actually has extensive descriptive profiles characterizing what households in each one of these segments look, behave, and think about and how they spend their money. For a quick taste, you can look at this little poster here. Just give you an example of what we're talking about. This segment 16, the Beltway Boomers, are simply categorized as living in a suburban area, upscale, 50 plus, most of them have kids, they tend to be homeowners, and above average use of technology. And then there's some illustrative marketplace behaviors to help the marketer understand with how the segment thinks and feels. So they order things from Macy's, they attend professional basketball games, they read Entrepreneur Magazine, they watch the cooking channel, and they eat at Romano's Macaroni Grill. Now, of course, they don't literally mean every single household in this segment does those exact behaviors, but they're meant to illustrate these are the sort of typical bucket of marketplace behaviors that's unique to this segment. Now that we have a better understanding of what the Nielsen Prism segmentation system is and how it can be used, we can now go and understand how the segment distribution tool can be useful for our purposes. Across the United States, these different segments are scattered at different levels of density depending on a particular geographic area. A marketer may be interested in understanding how these particular segments uh, allocate themselves in a particular geographic space. So for example here, I'm going to search across households, but I want to see a particular county in the United States, what their compos composition is of the different Nielsen prism segmentation profiles. 
selfishly, I'm going to go back to my home county of Monroe County. After a moment, we get our results. We see here, running across the rows, all of the different names of those segment codes. These are the prison segmentation uh, system names. So it goes up from 1 to 68, 68 being Bedrock America, 1 being Upper Crust. We have the households across the United, entire United States here. So this is the count adding up to a total of 122.2 million US households. The percent comp here is telling you the percentage. The percent comp for the United States is telling you of the entire US what percentage of that is, rep, uh, is represented by this particular segment. So this upper crust segment is estimated to be 1.05% of the entire US household population. Now, if we look over here at Monroe County, we can actually get an count estimate, percent comp interpreted exactly the same way, just now, just for Monroe County in particular. And we have an index value. So this benchmarks the rate at which this particular segment is expected to be found in Monroe County relative to the overall incidence rate in the entire United States. Now, Monroe County has absolutely no upper crust individuals, no movers and shakers, and no young digerati, so an index of actually zero. We notice here, the segment gray power composes 1.17% of the entire US population, but it only comprises 0.29% of the Monroe County population. So the index value here is much less than 100, it's 25. So we could say that compared to the United States, gray powers in Monroe County are 75% less likely to occur. On the other hand, big fish, small pond over indexes substantially. While it only comprises 1.63% of the entire US population, it comprises 3.87% of the entire Monroe County population. Let's take a look at what that profile is. Older, upper class, college educated professionals, members of Big Fish Small Pond are often among the leading citizens in their small town communities. Their income is upscale. Average users of household technology. They generally don't have children. They tend to be homeowners. Apparently they own Subarus. I don't know if that's entirely true in southeastern Michigan, 